A year and a half ago, two international human rights organizations published a report entitled You Don't Exist. The report talks about illegal detentions on both sides of the conflict line. According to these organizations, the Ukrainian side detained people in the building of the Kharkiv Department of the Ukrainian Security Service. However, the SBU denies this information. During this time, we at Hromatsky have been gathering evidence to confirm or deny these facts. Why, after four years of the Russo-Ukrainian war, through all the outrage, torture and human rights violations, is it important for us to know if these secret SBU prisons exist? Unlike the self-proclaimed republics, Ukraine has a rule of law and there should be a legitimate reason for detaining someone. If these secret SBU prisons really exist and separatists have been detained there, why haven't there been any formal charges? Why hasn't anyone been tried? Are people being held for the purpose of prisoner exchanges? And if so, have any Ukrainian soldiers been exchanged for one of these people detained in the SBU prison? And what was the reason for detaining people like this? I would like to ask the separatists from that side where and in what kind of conditions people are being detained. We have to act lawfully because we have rule of law. Dear friends, don't help the enemies. Do you understand? At the start of the war during the Battle of the Summer of 2014, dozens of people were captured on both sides of the contact line. However, the prisoners were exchanged very quickly. The negotiations for this took place between commanders of the volunteer battalions on the Ukrainian side and various field commanders from the militant side. In the summer of 2014, this group consisted of up to two dozen people. This is footage from the Hromatsky documentary, Contact where the unofficial negotiators for the prison exchange were Vladimir Rubin from the organization Officer Corps and, oddly enough, the singer Ruslana. This footage was filmed in Donetsk after the first battles in June-July 2014, when the negotiators took the newly released Ukrainian soldiers away. We are leaving the checkpoint, another four hours. Some for me, some for Ruslana, and Mustafa was even given one. Rubin was detained on the 8th of March 2018 on charges of arms trafficking through the conflict line. He's suspected of plotting the Ukrainian president's assassination. Rubin denies the charges. However, in 2015, the SBU established the Center for Hostage Release, which started dealing with hostages in a centralized way. The militants also appointed their own people to deal with it. The exchange issue began to be discussed as part of the Minsk agreements, at which point the everyone release terms became a political and security issue. The stakes were raised, exchanges started to happen less frequently. Family, don't worry, we are protecting you. Before the new year 2015, the hottest point of the front line was the Donetsk airport. During these battles, Ukrainian soldiers were captured almost every day. At least two of them were killed in prison by militants at the end of January 2015.
You know who's captured you, right? Motorola's division, Motorola's Sparta battalion. Ihir Branovitsky is a gunman from the 81st Battalion. He was captured by the militants Givi and Motorola during the battle for the Donetsk airport in January 2015. Where are you from, mute? I have a right to remain silent. Oh, you're cocky. He's shell-shocked, fuck. He's an officer. Bronovitsky Ihor Yevgenievich, surname, name, and patronymic in full. Bronovitsky Ihor Yevgenievich. Your year of birth? 1976. You speak Russian well, are you not ashamed? This video was taken on January 21st, 2015. This is the last footage we have of Bronovitsky alive. On that same day, he was tortured and all of his ribs were broken. After that, the militant Motorola went down into that basement and shot the soldier in the head. There were about a dozen people in the basement at that time who witnessed this murder. You were accused of killing cyborg Ihor Bronovitsky. Could you somehow comment on that? I don't give a fuck about what I'm accused of. Believe me, I shot 15 prisoners. I don't give a fuck at all. No fucking comment. I kill if I want to. I don't if I don't. However, at least nine people have stated that they were arrested by representatives of various security agencies on Ukrainian territory in December 2014 and at the start of January 2015. According to them, they were all handed over to representatives of the Ukrainian Security Service and held in the defunct Kharkiv SBU compound for more than a year. But do these secret compounds really exist? In July 2016, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch stated that 13 people had been released from the SBU compounds in Kharkiv. Two of them are from the small town of Ukrainsk in the Donetsk region. This is Viktor Shikhman. He was working at the mine in his hometown his whole life. But according to him, in May 2014, he was asked to organize a so-called referendum in the so-called Donetsk People's Republic. The movement for the referendum started here. Representatives from the so-called Donetsk People's Republic came to us on May 1st. A lot of people gathered, there were some speeches. And then they started to ask who would be able to help with the referendum. When they found out I was a former Ukrainian city councillor, they asked me to help with this. I thought there was nothing wrong in that. I ended up carrying out the referendum. Actually, that's what I was accused of. And on December 7th, in the middle of the night, there was a knock at the door. I opened, and standing there were these guys in balaclavas. There were six of them in total in front of the porch. Does Viktor Alexeyevich live here? Yes, I said, to the wall. They took me away that same day. I started to worry. I had to work the next day. Don't worry, we'll tell them everything at work. You'll only be here two days and then we will return you, they said. Well, that two days turned into 597 days. His wife has been looking for him the whole time and even reported his disappearance to the police. But the police could not find him either. The Ukrainian security service also responded, saying that they had never detained this person. Ashikmin himself states that for almost all of this time he was being held at the Kharkov department of the SBU in the now defunct compound. They put me in front of a prison cell. Take off the bag on your head. I took the bag off. I watched the door open in front of me. I go in and there are 15 people. The cell is small and the guys are unshaven. My first impression was, where am I? The guy started smiling and asked, are you a separatist? Yes, I'm a separatist, I told them. Don't worry, we're all friends here. At that moment, there were 13 of us in one cell. After that, they squeezed in more and made it 17. At times, we had to sleep in shifts. One person sleeps in the afternoon, and the other uses the same bed to sleep at night. Viktor Shukhmin says that Mikola Vakaruk, his fellow townsman and a colleague from the mine, was kept at the same prison. (laughs) 
In May 2014, Vakaruk put a DPR flag on top of the Ukrainsk city council. I was detained on December 9th. Four people with no chevrons, no other identification at all, black uniforms, black balaclavas. We arrived to Kharkiv on December 23rd and were summoned for interrogation. I was so happy, from basements, from battalions to a legal environment. But no such luck. The investigators looked at the documents and said, what's the point of reading them? Any lawyer can prove it's nonsense. As in, that I will be exchanged. According to Vakaruk, Konstantin Biskaravaini was also in that cell. Biskaravaini is a communist, a member of the Konstantinivka city council in Donetsk region. Just like Vakaruk and Ashukhmin, Biskaravaini also claims that during his detention he was kicked and tortured. They threatened that they would shoot me to death or put something up my buttocks, or take me to a prison in Korosten that is full of tuberculosis and AIDS. I had a stroke and after this doctors came to see me wearing masks. And while with Vakaruk and Ashukhmin there were no mentions of their detention, the SBU did report on Beskaravaini's detention. The counterintelligence under Ukraine's security service detained a member of the Konstantinovka city council in the Donetsk region. This crazy communist, along with other criminals detained, wanted to contaminate the water reservoirs of Konstantinovka with potassium cyanide. But even 15 months after this SBU report, Biskaravaini's wife still had no idea where her husband disappeared to. I made so many appeals, around 100 perhaps, and I received nothing but a kilogram of water back, a kilogram of rejections, a kilogram of lies. He was like a ghost. There were no reports about his detention, about his arrest. His name wasn't mentioned anywhere. We made appeals to the ISBU while we were preparing this report. What do you know about Mr. Biskaravaini? We asked them. Nothing, nothing at all. We didn't detain him. His name never popped up. We don't know anything, they replied. Konstantin Biskaravaini got back home to Konstantinivka in February 2016. In July of the same year, Ashukhmin and Vakaruk returned to Ukrainsk. One by one, they summoned us to the office on the fourth floor. There we had to write that we promised not to disclose the locations we were kept in, and that we confessed to our actions, that we were just recruited and we are SBU officers. If we didn't sign it, we wouldn't be able to walk free. But we had already spent so long there, that we were happy to, to agree with anything, just so that we could go home. They took us in the direction of Izum. We ourselves did not know where we were taken to. Is it an exchange? Not an exchange? They left us in between Kramatorsk and Drushkivka and gave us each a hundred hryvnia and our documents. And I asked them, what about the documents about where we were kept? Tell them you were on a work trip, they said, while handing over the 100 hryvnia. What great pay, I retorted, a hundred hryvnia for 600 days. Both Ashukhmin and Vakaruk never denied the crimes committed in May 2014, but they were angry about the fact that the accusations was not official. If they had sentenced me for carrying out this referendum, I would have served the sentence. I would have at least known when I'd get home. My wife would have come to visit me, would have brought me things. We would have had conversations, dates, but instead we didn't see each other for 600 days. Vakaruk hung a flag of the so-called DPR in Ukrainsk, and Ashukhmin organized a pseudo-referendum in this town. According to the Criminal Code of Ukraine, these actions were considered threats to the country's territorial integrity. From Article 110, Criminal Code of Ukraine, willful actions committed to change the territorial boundaries or national borders of Ukraine in violation of order provided for in the Constitution of Ukraine and also public appeals or distribution of materials with appeals to commit any such actions shall be punishable by restraint of liberty for a term up to three years or imprisonment for the same term. But according to the men, no charges were pressed against them. They claimed they were kept there just for the sake of future prisoner exchanges. But these swaps happened so rarely and when they did, Ashukhmin and Vakaruk and Beskaravaini were left out. In May 2016, a UN committee against torture were denied permission to check the prison. The men say they were let out of the Kharkiv SBU prison in three parts. 
Between July and August 2016, 18 people were released in total. They claimed that after this, the Harkov SBU compound had no one left inside. On September 1, 2016, Vasil Hrutsak, the head of Ukraine security service, came to Kharkiv. He wanted to congratulate the graduates of the Law Academy. <laughs> then suddenly, he decided to also showcase an SBU temporary detention center to the journalists who were present. The SBU has no secret prisons, first of all. I say this with confidence. In order to get rid of any uncertainties, I invite you, can we go right now, actually, just like this, without warning? The Harkov Pre-Trial Detention Center has been closed since Soviet times, special representatives say. But the building has been renovated inside. There are even cells with showers. There are no tools for torture. The other two rooms don't have them either, says Eduard Tritzin. This room is for the investigator and for the guards to rest. The rest of the rooms were shut and sealed because they weren't used. But for the press, all the doors are open. Within a month after the press tour around the Kharkov Pre-Trial Detention Center, the UN Committee Against Torture was finally allowed in. In April 2017, the committee reported that their September trip left them with a clear impression that some rooms and spaces were squeaky clean and made to look as if no one was ever kept inside them. Six months after the UN and journalists' visits, our camera crew received the permission to film inside this SBU pre-trial detention center. But a day before this, we go to the town of Krainsk again. We decided to show the video recorded by journalists who were invited by the head of the Ukrainian security service early in September to three people, Ashukhmin, Vakaruk, and another man, Yuri Iluhin, who claims he was also kept at the Kharkov detention center. The SBU doesn't have any secret prisons. This is the main exit. There's a flight of stairs, and between the second and third floor, the staircase is locked. This building stands like this, then the four-story building, and then the Ministry of Interior, like this. There's a partition here. Our cells were there. Behind this partition? Yes, yes. There are doors, and over there is the dining room. And here in the video, this is Dima. Here's Dima. They describe the details that weren't captured by our colleagues. The toilet is surrounded by shelves like this. And the toilet and then the shower. This is plastic, I think. That's how thick it was. Yeah, we made dominoes from it. I made myself a cross with it. I had nothing to do, so I just sat and made things. I cut out dominoes. Half of this was cut off. The corners were cut because I cut everything. They say there's not even water there. It cuts out there in the corridor under the suspended ceiling. Both hot and cold, yes. A slab in the suspended ceiling moves and it blocks the hot and cold water, opposite every cell. That's not Euro by chance. In, the, in a balaclava? He has the same walk as Euro. It's definitely Euro. My dear pal, it's him, it's him. Who is Euro? He's one of the shift supervisors. And what is that? Is this a unit? Here is the monument, the pathways. What can you see from the window of the first cell, for example? And there is a hole there, here in the very corner, in the polycarbonate, on that side. And where is it? It's in the third one as well. There was another interesting thing. These are alarm buttons for calling the guards. They are connected to the ventilation, to the hood, because if they cut off the ventilation hood, then our alarm buttons would not work either. Mm. 
проходить. Открывай. By the way, the room was equipped before the 2012 European Football Championship, supposedly for VIPs, foreigners who might start a riot. Let's move on, please. These conditions were made for them, but no one was detained and held in here. Everybody behaved well. The tile was laid by a man we know, Yura Tishenko. We also talked to Yuri Tishenko from Druskivka. He patrolled the streets of the city together with the militants in May 2014. The Ukrainian security officers later detained him for this. He claims that he did most of the repair work in the cells of the Kharkov prison himself. And this was not for the 2012 European Football Championships, which take place at Kharkov, as the SBU says, but in 2015 and 16 for the prisoners and their supervisors. <laughs> I did the repair work in the shower room for the sub-officer. I can tell you what was in there, where it was, how it was placed, and what is even kept in there, because I did it all. I fitted the tiles, I laid the partitions there, installed the shower unit, and I also sorted the plumbing. The hot water tank hangs above the toilet further up, behind the partition. As soon as you walk in the door, there's a sink, a shower unit, there's a cupboard in there, paper, tissues, and all of that kind of stuff. But let's return to Ukrainsk, where the three men continue telling us not only about the details of life in their cells, but about the people they saw there from the SBU leadership. Pivovar, he was sitting on the sixth floor. We addressed all the statements to his name. Pivovar, not Pivovarov, but Pivovar, head of the Kharkiv SBU. Alexander Pivovar, the head of the Kharkiv SBU, was dismissed by degree of the president on July 16, 2016. Eduard Kurtzen was appointed as his replacement the same day. We tried to get in contact with Pivovar, but the SBU would not help us with this. Edward Kurtzen showed us the SBU prison in January 2017. Today is January 16, 2017. We are in Kharkiv next to the main directorate of the Kharkiv SBU. Yesterday, my colleagues visited people who claimed that they were held in this building for over a year. We are now trying to determine whether the details they have described match what we may or may not find here. We haven't met. What's your name? Officer. He's on duty. I am a public figure, but this person is not allowed to answer. Here as well. I'm looking where the doors were. The paint was the same beige, like in there, right? So everything was painted. Yes, they were already dirty. It was painted before the 2012 Euro Football Championship as well, or when? Yes, the door is in that color. Grey, it was a sort of cream color. It was light, like the ceiling here. I see something's torn here, some kind of hole. Punctured. Who made this hole? When they cleaned the bars and the column bashed against the corner a little bit. There is a hole there, well, there, right in the polycarbonate, in the corner, and in the third cell there is one as well. <laughs> Will we be blown up? <laughs> what is it? What is it for? I don't know. This is where it leads to, outside. <laughs> to ventilate the air. Guys, there's no light. There was another interesting thing. These are alarm buttons for calling the guards. They are connected to the ventilation, to the hood. Because if they cut off the ventilation hood, then our alarm buttons would not work either. Whom are these toilets for? For the workers? These toilets are also 50 years old. Oh, and, and here's the boiler. Yes, which one is that? The, the shower room? For these showers, which don't work anymore. Yes, yes. 
Water. Vada. And what is the sink here for? Well, this kind of tap, you get a bucket and clean. Aha, uh -huh. it's for buckets of water. Someone cleans here, right? Yes. That's where the boiler hangs. Here on the right. Here between them is the tap to fill buckets. There's one here, one tap, two taps in the washroom, and inside between them, there's a tap at the bottom. I understand that these are all barred up. This is the second floor. Yes, yes. What's with the memorial over there? The Czechist. We'll go and have a look if you want. I read that the KGB were here in 1962. Well, yes, before that, in 1934, the NKVD was here too, then the Gestapo, and then the KGB came. Why does he have an umbrella? <laughs> That's the tradition. As soon as I arrived, I immediately went to walk around the whole premises, where they were located. Also, when I was the head of the Information Security Department, I read a lot of articles where it said that people were being illegally detained here, tortured and everything. Naturally, my main task was to walk around the premises, seeing if there were any violations of constitutional human rights. That's what I did first. Well, naturally, I did not find anything. Yes, yes, I carried it out. The information I've just stated, that in principle no one was detained here. We are with one of the people who claimed that they were detained here. We talked with him. For example, he says that he was ill, and the security service officers took him from here to the hospital and then brought him back. How can someone invent a whole story like that? The thing is that, regardless, a large number of people have been detained here at some point in the past. Naturally, it's not a problem for people to find the layout, how the cells are arranged. It's possible if you put your mind to it. I'm not going to say who could do this, though, but nevertheless, it's not a problem. You say this is 10 people telling outright lies to the international organization because they were recruited by, for example, the Russian Federation. I cannot state that. Mikola Vakaru claims that he was not just held in the Kharkiv SBU building. SBU employees took him to a hospital in Kharkiv when he had serious kidney problems. In March, my kidneys seized up, beaten and frostbitten. I received no medication apart from a simple painkiller. It got serious on the 25th. For two days in a row, nothing was able to calm the fever. They took me to the hospital under the name Sergei Petrovich Ivanov. I was warned immediately on the way there. I was brought to emergency room number four in Kharkiv, and from there to hospital number 17. They operated in the end in the regional clinical center for urology and nephrology. A year later, we went with Mikola Vakaruk to the same hospital, where he spent a month and received the operation. Well, it's true. I was so weak that when they took me back to the prison, they took me in a wheelchair to the prison van. And that's where I met my cellmates, because they had already allocated cell number six for me and the former dentist, Konstantin Bezkarovayny. He's from Konstantinovka. It's already been a year. Well, yes. I was thin until July, until they released me. I bandaged you every day. Of course, I recognized you recovered. I have... I have guessed. Well, good job. You've come around. You look good. You already? Well, you've recovered, yes. Do you remember I brought you a cooked apple? Well, yes, I remember you. 
And do you know under what circumstances the patient was brought in? I'm not Siryoja. Well, yes, I was Siryoja when I was with the SBU. No, really? Well, how do you say it? What's your name? My name is Kolya. Kolya? Well, we didn't know we knew him as Ivanov. There's a war going on, so there's defamation. They just want to discredit us constantly. In response to our questions about when the renovation of the facility for the 2012 Euro Football Championship took place, who the contractor was and how much money was spent, the Harkov SBU replied that, after three years, the documents were disposed, according to the legislation. The aforementioned criminal case started by the aforementioned military prosecutor's office was closed down due to Part 1, Part 1, Article 284 of the Criminal Procedure Code of Ukraine. We also approached the Lviv and Donetsk SBU branches with questions about whether they renovated the defunct compounds before the 2012 Euro Football Championships, like the Kharkov branch did. They said no. We would like to inform you that the Lviv Regional Department of the Security Service of Ukraine has not had a single pre-trial detention center or any other place for detaining people accused of crimes since 2003. Over the course of the 2012 European Championship, the Donetsk Regional SBU Department had not installed any cells for detaining foreign criminals in its premises. It had been one and a half years since the You Don't Exist report was published. At the request of the international organizations, the Military Prosecutor's Office opened a criminal investigation into the illegal detention of people. Konstantin Biskaravainy was the only one recognized as a victim. The other people were not given any status. On January 16, 2018, in response to our question about how the case is going, we were told that it had already been closed on March 10, 2017, due to the absence of any crime committed. The aforementioned criminal offense specified by the Military Prosecutor's Office was closed on March 10, 2017, according to Point 1, Part 1 of Article 284 of the Criminal Procedure Code of Ukraine. Article 284 of the Criminal Procedure Code of Ukraine. The facts we gathered give us reason to believe that the secret SBU prison in Kharkov did exist during 2014 to 2016. But for what? The people we have talked about were not charged with any crimes or swapped for Ukrainian soldiers captured by militants. Did their detention change anything? Did it improve our safety? Or was justice served? If these people never had a status, does that mean anyone could have been in their place? If the existence of these detention facilities is kept secret and publicly denied, and no one from the law enforcement agencies investigates these circumstances, where's the guarantee that someone won't end up in one of these detention centers? tomorrow. The illegal detention of these people without a trial or investigation has only created problems for Ukraine. The West is telling us that we are acting the same way as Russia, the country we are fighting against. And the Russian media is loving the story about secret prisons. Only this time, it is not made up. We can't compare how the self-proclaimed republics behave with the prisoners to how Ukraine does, because Ukraine, unlike the pseudo-republics, as the head of Ukraine Security Service correctly stated, has rule of law. And a rule of law state cannot violate either its own or international laws. So there's only one question remaining. Who will be held responsible for this? I would like to ask the separatists from that side where and in what kind of conditions people are being detained. We have to act lawfully because we have rule of law. Dear friends, don't help the enemies. Do you understand? 